Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Mage Errant, Book Three, A Traitor in Skyhold, Chapters Six, Seven, Eight, Nine, and Ten. Gifts, Silence and Sand, Fatigue, An Unpleasant Surprise, and The Hidden Valley. I really wish that he hadn't chosen a name that he could potentially be sued for using, because I think they're owned by Kraft Foods. In these chapters, Hugh gets in Sabe's face a little bit, and I am really here for it. Good for you, Hugh. Retiring until it comes to somebody else. Hard relate. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you very much to Dan for commissioning this episode. What's up, Dan? So there are a bunch of like little moments in these chapters that some of them get sort of like resolved and expanded on. And then there are some that we don't really get a resolution to. And one of them is Hugh hearing Rhodes call his name behind him in the hall Y'all, I don't know what to think about that because the way he says it, it's like it could go either way. It could be I'm about to bully him and I'm about to like ruin everything and I'm making it seem friendly in an overt way so that another person might not know. But if you're aware of our relationship, you'd know perfectly well that I'm just fucking with him or it could be a... I am going to like try and be civil for the moment because I'm not here to just like ruin your fucking day. And honestly, the thing I keep coming down on is that I have no reason to think that Rhodes has any like need to talk to Hugh other than to ruin his day. You know, there's nothing I know of that Hugh is involved with that Rhodes has any business talking to him about. So I'm erring on the side of he was about to be bullied again. But I also do kind of feel like I I don't see the author just doing that the same way again. I, I feel like after everything that's gone on with Hugh, Rhodes is realizing like either that Hugh isn't somebody to fuck with the way that he thought or that Hugh is like slightly more high profile. Like he used to be kind of a nobody and Rhodes was able to get away with bullying him in a way that felt like, well, all the other teachers might not condone this, but they also know that Hugh is a like an incompetent mage. And so they're going to like sort of have a low level contempt for him themselves and not really be hard on Rhodes. And also Rhodes has the whole family ties thing, but now Hugh has the favor of some pretty high profile folks. And I don't know Rhodes, if anything, seems like somebody who knows how to play that sort of game and wouldn't go and offend a person who has who's networked basically you know who has connections so i kind of think like it's more likely that's not what was going on but i just don't have any evidence to point to as to why he would want to suddenly have a chat so i just wanted to mention that out of the gate because you guys know the like last episode i was just sort of like what's uh what's happening with this guy anyway when when are we going to see him again But anyway, okay, so chapter six, that fifth day, a sand ship from Therestel arrived bearing gifts or rather rewards. And this is when they all start getting the things that they had asked for as boons from Indris. Um, And (laughs) Hugh is thinking about the fact that he himself did not ask for anything specific and that he basically just like owes her a favor and he is feeling very doubtful 
as to whether or not he's ever going to have the nerve to like call in that favor. And um, this is the sort of thing where I'm like, Hugh, if you don't know you by now, <laughs> you are absolutely only going to call this favor in on behalf of somebody else. Like, it's just not Hughes's style to be like, oh, you know what? I figured out what I want. I was, uh, I was scrolling through Amazon the other day and there was this thing that was kind of out of my price range. And then I remembered that Indris owes me. So I'm just going to send her a link real quick and she can pick it up and have it sent. No, Hugh is going to like low key try and forget about this favor because it makes him uncomfortable and then something fucking catastrophic is going to happen and he's going to realize oh i guess this is the only thing that i can do is like ask for help and cash this in at least that's the way i see it happening um and i really wonder like what that's going to look like if the favor he cashes in is going to be sort of a, a complete like swoop in and save us sort of favor or if it's going to be a uh i know that you can't save us for whatever reason but can you give us the means to save ourselves and again y'all this is just me going off of sort of tropes and stuff like that so we'll see but i just wanted to mention that because he is just really weird about how that all went down um Sabe had requested the return of an amulet that one of her ancestors had lost in a bet against Indris, something about a contest over control of a storm or some such. Hugh was fairly sure the amulet was enchanted, but Sabe wouldn't say anything else on the matter. Um, okay, of course it's enchanted, first of all, Hugh. Like, come on. Nobody's going to be... I mean, I, I suppose... You could be like, well, this is just like got enormous sentimental value and it would be a shame to lose it. But like, yeah, I'm pretty confident that this is something that's got like magical value. And I'm almost wondering like whether or not this is something that is related to the fact that Sabe's grandmother is coming to visit, which she hears about and kind of freaks out over later. And I know that like it's probably more than possible for Sabe to just send this amulet with somebody to her homeland but i don't know maybe it's like really worth a lot and not something that her grandmother just wants sent fedex and so she's gonna turn up and, and get it herself that said i have to be honest my first thought when sabe said that her grandmother was coming to visit is that her grandmother wants to meet hugh after what he did like her whole specialty is wards and he used the notebook of her wards and information and whatnot to do a thing at a very young age that was incredibly high profile and basically like he used some of Sabe's clan's magic like their secret way to feed into the ward and keep itself sustaining he used that to save indris's ass which is kind of a big deal i feel like in terms of i don't know feeling like it's not like she's materially getting anything out of it but i can't help but think she smirked to herself when she heard that that was how they managed to keep indris from getting completely like overthrown and killed so I don't know. Sabe is, is so sure that her grandmother can't be coming for any other reason than because she's got like a marriage that she is setting up. That's that's, you know, we have a whole thing with Sabe about this later and it's just really tough. Um, but I think that Sabe really did her family proud and that her grandmother is going to want to see her and the other kids that she did her thing with you know and i don't know sabe is just so certain it has to be bad and it's kind of funny because later on when they're talking like the thing starts off with you being like i tend to build things up in my head until they're way worse in my head than they turn out to actually be and she gets very like, well, are you saying my problems are just in my head? And he actually catches that she's trying to sidestep the thing. But 
I, I do think it's funny that she doesn't really like he, pay attention to what he's saying in that moment. And then when she's telling him what she thinks is about to happen, that's exactly what she's doing is, is creating something out of literally nothing. And it's one of those things that you can see very easily when your friends are doing this, but it's a lot harder to catch yourself when you're doing it because when we're doing it, we have told ourselves this whole story usually about how like, well, based on what this person has done in the past and the way that they react to stuff and blah, blah, blah. I know that X, Y, Z is probably true. So this is an informed guess, not me just making things up. And the truth is it can be both, you know, and the things that you make up in your head, they may be a valid assumption in some ways but they are also still assumptions and not real and i am very guilty of letting myself get sort of carried away on this sort of thing so anyway um it was talia and godric's rewards that were being delivered today talia had requested the bones of aterg this had been a slightly ridiculous request on her part but indris apparently not having any interest in mounting her traitorous mate's bones in her hall with the bones of her other rivals had agreed i love that with the bones of her other rivals where what is she doing with them like this is the sort of thing that whenever i hear about it i just really have to because this isn't, you know, there's there's plenty of other things I've read where people keep sort of um, tokens or trophies of people that they have beaten or killed. And uh, I cannot decide about, I guess it really depends on the circumstances. But like, obviously, she's a beast. She's not a human, right? I'm sure she would object to the term beast animal feels like also not quite right though monster feels mean like i don't know what to call her but she is not a person so her standards are going to be slightly different than mine anyway um but i just feel like i don't know that i would want the reminders of like people and and creatures i killed just in my face all the time i just don't know I, you know i don't know it makes me think of uh those of you who have seen uh breaking bad there is a storyline with this guy, I think his name is Tuco, and Hank takes this dude out and there's a big shootout and it's a whole thing. And his friends, as a joke, get Tuco's grill from his teeth, that like kind of gold decorative thing that some people wear. They almost look like top braces, but they'll often have like a jewel or something in them. And they get it sunk into a cube of some kind of plastic so that he can have it as a paperweight, basically. It's like a memento of the man he killed. And it's such a weird scene because when they give it to him, they act like it's this big joke and he sort of rolls with it. But as he continues thinking about it, he feels fucked up over it. And it clearly bothers him, like, to treat this man who was a person like he's just mounting the head of a deer on the wall. And eventually, Hank, because he's sort of, I think he's sort of dealing with some PTSD from the shootout, to be honest. He goes and just chucks it in a river somewhere and doesn't say anything about it and that's the end of that. But uh, that's the sort of thing I often think about is like, I could see in the moment, if there's somebody who's particularly terrible, and I like defeat them, being like, yeah, put his bones in my room. But I feel like a day or two passes. And then I start to be like, you know, maybe, maybe I, maybe I don't need those bones in my room. Maybe I could use that space for like, you know, pop a some chair or something, a little mini fridge for myself. Maybe I don't need to to hold on to this grizzly trophy. That's all I'm saying. Um, but this fucking skull that they give her is so big that they wind up having to dry, like pull it behind the ship. Um, 
Let's see. It had taken until now for what remained of Ateyerg's massive corpse to be removed from the ruined neighborhood he had died in and stripped of its flesh. I really do appreciate the reminder of the ruined neighborhood. Just the fact that like there are some real casualties to all this. This is not a situation where you know we just like end the the battle and hooray the city is all fine again it's really clear that this author intends to like take the fact that things were damaged and destroyed very seriously and it gets brought up not infrequently and i do appreciate that because i feel like that sort of destruction is sort of like glazed over in certain things sometimes and uh, I, it, considering the amount of like, I, I won't say it's like heavy social commentary, but I think John Bierce has been fairly consistent in making comments here and there about certain things. I do feel like if he just sidestepped that entirely and didn't talk about it, it would feel weird um, in con- in the context of the other stuff that he has brought up. So... Um, MX Shard says medieval warlord shit there. Yeah. Dan says, look, if your horde is a bank, you got to collect something. Why not the bones of your enemies? I just feel like, look, you can't, you can't make interest on a horde. And I get that, but I would, I would really, I think what it comes down to, I'm just not the Warren type. So my feelings of like satisfaction from this would be limited at best. And that's just, it's just a personality thing. What can you do? Um, the skull was so huge. It couldn't fit down into the hole without dissembling the deck. And so had it been hauled behind the ship. Candoran had not been pleased about having to arrange to store the bones. She'd only acquiesced when Alustin reminded her that Talia's strange bone affinity might have unusual interactions with dragon bones, which possessed a number of magical properties, even beyond their freakish strength and lightness. And this was an interesting thing that hadn't occurred to me because I'm not thinking about the the type of bones that Talia is going to get, right? My, honestly... Because I'm I'm not really like stopping and thinking through the logistics. When she asks for Ateerg's bones, I am assuming she doesn't mean all the bones. She doesn't mean whole bones. She means some bones. And it's gonna be enough to fit in like maybe a chest. You know, something that's it's much more portable, reasonably sized, the kind of thing that like in mass would be comparative to a weapon. But this size had never entered my head because I just didn't think that she was going to take his fucking skull. And so the storage issue hadn't entered my head either because I'm just like literally just you'll she'll get a chest full of bones and she'll put them in a room. Done. And that isn't the case at all. And the fact that Candoran has to figure this out for her is really interesting. And I'm wondering what kind of access she's going to have. And also storage, I'm assuming these bones are like somewhat like valuable. So somebody may want to bust in and take some stuff. So there's going to be security on it. I don't know. Um, And then we've got Godric. And this is exciting because I was really curious about what it was going to turn out to be with his new weapon. Um, So they had hauled the crate away from the empty ship to a stone pier nearby. The four of them clustered around the hammer's crate as Godric opened it. They'd been bugging him to tell them what kind of enchantment he'd requested ever since he met with the enchanters, but he'd refused every time. And he does a demonstration, uh, a sledgehammer even more massive than his last two. Intricate spell forms covered the blunt head and raced down its wooden shaft. They weren't merely carved into the hammer. It was as though someone had worked copper wire deep into the very metal of the hammer during its forging. And as though tendrils of oak had grown through the yew of the thick handle, all in the precise shape of spell forms, which sounds really pretty, actually. Like, this sounds very cool looking um so 
He balanced it and swung it gently a few times to test its balance, limbered up, reared back, and slammed the hammer full force into the stone walkway in front of him. As it descended, Hugh could see the spell forms on it begin to glow slightly. The ground actually cracked with the force of the blow, and rock chips went flying. And none of it made a sound. The impact was completely silent. What just... Sabe began, but cut off abruptly. Hugh looked at her and realized she was still moving her mouth, but nothing was coming out of it. Hugh tried to say something, and he could feel his vocal cords vibrate, but no sound came out of his mouth. He clapped his hands, but it was perfectly silent as well. He wasn't deaf. He could still hear sounds from the docks, the wind, the sand drakes making nuisances of themselves among the ringing of the ships, but Hugh and his friends were completely silent. Godric grinned, and then the faint glow of the hammer cut out. Neat, huh? I had to take the idea after all that sneaking around me and Talia had to do in Indris's palace. Would have made things a lot easier. It's also got a secondary enchantment to make it harder to break. And I do appreciate Hugh being like, I just thought that you would have picked something that would make you hit harder. And Godric being like, I don't know if you've noticed. I am strong as fuck. I hit hard enough. It's fine. And I was like, that's, you know what? Fair play, sir. Like, I'm always sure that you could hit harder, you know, not to say that there's not more you could do in that. But like, how often do you really need that? This is much more diversified. And I approve. I think this is a really interesting concept. And it's like the fact that it doesn't make a sound to smash. And then everything around him makes no sound for a minute. I mean, it doesn't last forever. It's only a few, maybe like a minute, it seems like. Um, but I am just sort of thinking about how many times he could hit in a row to sort of keep the sound down. And whether there are, I'm sure there are limitations with the hammer as far as how much mana it takes to like power that kind of spell. And so how many times he could use it in a row. But it's just, I think it's a really neat idea. And um, when they start talking about, like, the ad advantages of being quiet, Talia is saying how if, if you are a fire mage and you manage to sneak up on another fire mage, you're going to win. Like, being stealthy is a massive advantage. Whoever sees the enemy first is likely going to come out on top. And uh, when... They Hugh says, what if they start in plain sight of both of each other? Talia says they usually both die. And there's just something about every time we get like a reminder of just how much death Talia has personally seen. And the fact that she's killed before, you know, I'm always taken aback by it and I appreciate it. Because it feels like very legit in terms of the, the community that she has described. But I am always startled and sort of forget that I sort of sometimes see her as all talk, you know, as just somebody who's like got a, a really intense temper and is eager for a fight, but doesn't necessarily know what they're getting into when they do that. And I, if she's not that really she might bite off more than she can chew sometimes and she might be kind of thoughtless sometimes but that is not to say that she's like inexperienced or clueless about anything at all so i have to really remind myself fairly often um so this is when sabe gets the note and says that her grandmother is coming to visit and Talia is like, I thought you were close. Why are you acting like this is such bad news? You said, oh, crap, what's wrong? And she's like, she doesn't leave Rasandis. She's needed there. It's storm season for storm's sake. The coast will start getting hit by hurricanes any week now. And on top of that, this would be the equivalent of Indris deciding to randomly pay a social visit to Skyhold. It's just not done. And... Considering everything that went out up with the two or four of them 
and also the fact that there's like it seems to me a lot more rumblings happening around than just what's going on with Indris. I feel like she has gotten clued in on something further and wants to talk to Sabe and the rest of these kids about it. But I don't know. We'll see. Um, and she has to st- like Hugh gives her the advice that she has given him sometimes to like stop and take a slow breath. Um, so Tabby took a moment, seemed to get a little control over herself. Sorry about that. She said, eventually, um, Sabe drifted off. After a few moments, Talia cleared her throat and the taller girl's attention returned to them. The only reason that I can think that grandmother might be visiting is if she finally arranged a marriage for me. And after she says that, she just kind of bails. And we have the next few chapters. It's a while before we actually get any further information from her about the baggage that she has on that front. And um, I really want to be able to quote her directly or else I'd start talking about that now. But I'm going to wait until we get to that moment. So um, then we have the classes and the sort of summary with each of them, how they're doing. Um, So Hugh is, (laughs) he's getting put through his paces with Candoron, a lot of physical training and stuff with that as well. And just really getting his ass handed to him. He is a little disappointed. You, you get the feeling with the fact that ward crafting has so much, um, because of that student who recognized him and sort of made a fuss about him and everything. Every time they're in class and there isn't a ward to keep them from seeing, like seeing one another, he feels like everybody is watching him. And, um, this is something that hadn't really occurred to me. I was expecting that like Hugh was going to finally be able to excel in a class and feel good about that. But instead what happens is he just has all this attention and Hugh doesn't do well with having attention on him. And it didn't really enter my head that things would work that way. And So it's sort of getting in the way a little bit of him being able to like just relax and enjoy the class. Um, And then we go to uh, Emerson and this, the questions that Hugh wrote, one of them he waits to answer until after and one he answers during. Um, And the question was whether he was counting wards when he said not to test out new spell forms. And he says it, uh, the simple answer is I'm not qualified to teach you about them. So I'm not going to try. Hugh could see the journeyman with the long twitching hair roll her eyes. I was really curious about that. Why did she roll her eyes? This feels like a completely reasonable, like answer. I don't know. It just seemed as if she was sort of thinking that this was an excuse the vibe I was getting off of her was like, oh yeah, sure. And I don't really know what she thinks is happening there. Um, all spell forms for spells, glyphs, wards, and enchantments alike fundamentally serve the same purpose of guiding mana in specific patterns that generate effects. Each does this in an entirely different frame of reference, however. Spells operate in reference to the self Wards operate in reference to spatial location and enchantments operate in reference to the properties of the material they're worked into. This radically alters the behaviors of the patterns of each major spell form type during construction. While none of the three major types of spell form are what any sane person would call safe to tinker with, wards tend to be the safest of the three to alter and basic ward construction and alteration ends up being taught even to a small degree to first years most mages never advanced past there though some students emmonson glanced at hugh advance far beyond that level it grows much more dangerous with more advanced wards and wards that are left unattended for long periods of time tend to decay often becoming significant hazards. And 
I really did find it interesting. Like, you know, it's unclear some, sometimes to me who knows who Hugh is and what he's done and who doesn't. And this dude knows Hugh and is slightly impressed with him. I won't say like, you know, he's not effusive, but later he says something about how Hugh seems to be mostly on the right track, which for me, coming from this dude, is a massive compliment. That's as close to like actual praise as I think you're getting from him. Um, enchantments are by far the most dangerous of the three for the simple reason they're most likely to fail. Missing a simple flaw in the metal you're constructing your enchantment out of, for instance, can disrupt the flow of mana through the spell form. Only the most patient, cautious, and perfectionist of mages make successful enchanters. The rest tend to blow themselves up very quickly. And that was an, an interesting idea to me, the idea that, like, the material is that key and important um which i feel like is probably going to come up in regard to what you can do with crystal but who knows so um and then he mentions glyphs they're commonly treated as a tool for inferior mages while this is often true this is hardly always true quite a few highly effective battle mages make extensive use of glyphs uh, for our purposes, glyphs are interesting thanks to their relative safety to tinker with. They generally operate around the same as spells, but instead of referring to the self, they define the self as the material they're drawn on. A glyph failure is significantly safer than a spell failure. It can still be highly destructive, but you can remotely activate many glyphs from behind cover. There are a few important differences in their construction when compared to spells, however, which include, and that's the end of this. So this is one of those things where there's a lot of information dropped here and I'm unsure how much of each thing I really need to remember. So I'm honestly going to low key not try to remember most of it. And then if you guys want to bring it up later, if it turns out that I have forgotten it and it's relevant, feel free. Um, so after class this is when Emerson comes up to him and uh says like your skill level is high enough that you can fuck around with cantrips and um just be cautious about things but from what i've seen you are and then we have hugh meeting with candoron and he this is really funny candoron wants to see the book that is now hugh's like you know it's made out of crystal it has a personality and she mentions that the fact that it has a personality being pretty unusual and is like i think this is probably the result of the melding with the labyrinth stone and i can take care of that aspect of it for you because it shouldn't have this if you want me to and hugh says no and that it's growing on him but it's very funny because the spell book is like resisting her opening it. At one point it like spits at her and it's just a clump of paper that it's rolled up. But it's still meant to be just sort of disrespectful. Like, hey, leave me alone. And uh, there's a couple times where she like sinks a claw into it. In, in, and it's not like a physical thing that's happening. But it reacts with this sort of indignation. And he can feel that coming off it. And I had sort of thought that that was like due to his connection with it. But Candoran seems able to tell how it's feeling as well. It seems like whatever it's conveying in terms of its feelings, it's if not everybody around it sensing it, at least people who are maybe if like have the affinity of crystal can tell. Um and Candoran brings up a really good question, asking where it stores the paper. And then she figures out that the planar affinity that Hugh has got factored in a little bit when this thing basically upgraded. And she was sort of thinking that she didn't want him to do this, like, uh, attunement that quickly because sometimes whole sections of affinities don't get taken advantage of and is like, this is actually better than I would have expected. It's not ideal because the stellar affinity did go to waste. I don't see any evidence of that being part of this year, 
but the spatial thing is is you know it's in here and it's not like you can just stick anything it's not a fucking like you know bag of holding but you can put books in it it's a traveling library essentially um and so that's a cool you know aspect of this um i'd be a little shocked if it didn't manifest other abilities the internal pattern of an attuned ether crystal is extremely complex and continues to slowly change for quite a long time though there is one aspect you don't seem to have grasped do you remember how heavy your ether crystal was before you managed the proprioceptive link and she tells him basically that this bitch is still very heavy it's going to get heavier it's probably soon going to weigh as much as hugh does and just because that link is there and he can't tell doesn't mean it's not happening and that it will grow denser and heavier and um that this will probably make its pattern grow reinforced so that if something happens to it it may be able to just heal itself which is pretty cool that's a big advantage so then we go to chapter eight fatigue and this is when we go into talia's pov i'm not going to dwell on this for too long but talia is having a little bit of a tough time the fire mage that she's been tutoring under is a street performer like a you know and she doesn't really respect that very much so there's a bit of resistance in her with that um and let's see her tutoring under her dream mentor was the most infuriating woman she'd ever met the woman seemed convinced that talia's failures were entirely in her head not deriving from her tattoos and that she could overcome them by sheer force of will or something and this is the kind of thing where i'm like look that may be something that comes up for some people is that they kind of have you know a psychic block about a thing but if you're talking about sheer force of will and accusing Talia of not having enough to break through, I don't feel like you even know what your butt is. Like, all you have to do is talk to Talia for like two minutes and then you know force of will is not an issue for her. If she wanted to make this thing happen, she would fucking have made it happen. And the idea that she has to watch her kind of fuck up so bad that they both end up in the hospital before she believes her. This is just like a very common, especially with women. Uh, it's a, a really common thing for us to be told that struggles we're having with medical stuff are in our head and you know if we just lost some weight usually is like the number one piece of advice um and it's just incredibly frustrating because like i'm not trying to say that eating better and getting more movement in won't make a lot of us feel better than we currently feel but when people try and act as if i especially like if you live in the united states and you're experiencing a level of pain or difficulty that is bad enough to make you go to the doctor. We pay out the fucking nose for healthcare. If I'm at the doctor for it, it's bad. I'm not just, you know what I'm saying? Like, so the idea that it's just in our head and if we could have muscled through it, we would have. It's just so fucking annoying. Like, no, I have been muscling through it probably for at least a year by the time I make myself go to the doctor. And often when I call for an appointment, I have to wait for an appointment three months out. So by then even longer. And the, the assertion is just so frequent. That's what gets so tiresome. So I uh, really felt for Talia here because like there is nothing like a person. And again, I understand that sometimes having a mental block about stuff is very real. I'm not trying to act like that's just to dismiss that out of hand always. But this is the thing she's been dealing with her whole fucking life. I think she fucking knows whether it's real or not. Like, come on. Um, Emic Shard says very relatable as ADHD and being told to just try harder. Yeah, it is a tough thing with that. This is something that's 
much more recently become part of like the conversation as well. And it's very reassuring in some ways as somebody who realizes that I've struggled with that and time blindness is a major factor for me as well. And always feeling like I'm just a fuck up and then seeing that, no, this is like a symptom of a thing. It's helpful. It doesn't make me suddenly not suffer from these things. But seeing that it's not just a personality flaw helps. Um, that and trans broken arm syndrome, where the doctor will literally blame a broken arm on our hormone treatments or something. I have never heard this term, but so it's like, wait, like the, the saying that this like random other thing is responsible for what's bothering you in the, that honestly makes a lot of sense though. Ugh. That's so annoying. They really fucking find any way to just not do their job. I swear to God, I have very little patience for doctors these days. I really do. Um, and the bone affinity thing that she's uh, studying, the test chamber had a built in blast shield that hardly obscured her view at all. So she was having quite a lot of fun in there. And it turns out her abilities interacted in a very interesting way with dragon bone. Um, but we don't get to see what that is. It's just said then. And then cryptography is kind of killing her. And uh, she can get help with math through Godric, but cryptography is a new subject for all of them. So this isn't something that she can like turn to them. And it says something about how she like gets headaches from it. And this is something that I dealt with a lot when I, I this is once again, something that I didn't know was a thing, but I would be in such difficulty during class when I was um, in high school for geometry and algebra two that I would be ready to cry because I couldn't seem to keep the numbers in place on the page. They felt like they were moving around and it was just, it was mystifying. And I have since found out that there is dyslexia, which inverts letters and causes you to like misread or misspeak or misspell. There is a similar thing for numbers. And I 100% have that. And it was such a relief to find out that was real. Because I swear to God, you guys, I felt like I was losing my head. I would look at the page and I would have to read a number like four times before I could really be like, okay, that's the number. And I would, it would be just sitting there on the page. I'm just reading it and I would get it. I would invert numbers like every time, every time. It was really ridiculous. So I felt for Talia in both of these scenarios. Um, and then we have uh, Sabe and the fact that she is really struggling with this like internal she wants to talk to them, but she doesn't. She's having a really hard time here where it's like she's not hiding the fact that she's upset. But she doesn't want to sit down and talk it out, which I understand. Um, and the conversation that Hugh has with her, I really appreciate it because Hugh basically tells her, you seem to get kind of frustrated with us when we don't want to tell you stuff. And we've poured our hearts out a few times now and you're acting like you don't have to do the same thing. And that's not fair. And that's not right. It's not good. And I need you to get over it and start sharing a little bit. And Sabe is like, Again, at first she tries to sidestep it and start a fight about something else. He calls her on it. I loved that he saw through it. And then she tells him, basically, that her mother ran off and married against the family's will, a man who was a healer. And at first, she felt like she had done the right thing, that she loved her life, that it was the right choice. That love was worth it. And then as Sabe grew and it became clear that the mixture of the healing and the storm affinities were not working out, 
she grew less and less outspoken about the fact that she had pursued love at the expense of everything else. And Sabe says something about how, like, she would tell her always marry for love until after it was revealed what her difficulties were. And she never said it again after that. And basically, Sabe is like, I am not trying to say that I am entirely a failure, but in terms of what's expected of my family, I sure can't do what they need me to do. And my mother paid a price she didn't even know she was paying. And if she had married the way that she was instructed, I wouldn't be put in the position now of struggling so badly with basic stuff. So it was a really awful thing to feel as if like her, she herself was a rebuke against her mother and what she had done and that her mother saw her as like, Oh, here finally are the consequences of my actions. And besides all that and like you know the the feelings of what you represent to a parent there's also the fact that Sabe had told herself after what her mother did I'm not going to do that when it's time for me to get married I'll marry who I'm told to marry and I'm not going to put a big fuss up about it and I'm going to do my duty and whatever but finds herself when she's faced with the idea it's not even like she's told there's a marriage thing happening it's just the, the suggestion in her own mind that she may have been maybe on the receiving end of orders to marry soon she immediately like feels herself digging her heels in and wanting to rebel against it and she's really frustrated because she thought she'd be able to face doing this with her resolve hardened and she is just startled at how quickly the the concept of that made her go nope 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 not doing it and i really really appreciate that because this is something that um you know it, it's one thing to feel very certain about how you're going to react to something based on what your parents have done and a lot of us will go through our lives going out of our way to not repeat the mistakes of our parents sometimes. And then you'll find yourself occasionally uh, beyond your understanding doing the same thing, even though you had, you could have sworn your whole deal was to not do this. And that is just something about like patterns and trauma and, and, seeing things unfold a certain way in your personal life fucking annoying it is so annoying this is something that i really had a kind of a moment with my mother had an affair for a long time when i was growing up she was seeing somebody else behind my dad's back for literally years and i knew about it and i really did judge her for it I understood why and my, their relationship was bad, but I always was just like, you should just leave. And this is ridiculous. And I really held on to this feeling of just like, just leave, just leave. It's not that hard. And then I found myself having an affair. Uh, my last husband, Brendan, who I started podcasting with, I met Owen while I was still married. And I could have just left once I realized that I was like done and into somebody else and that I didn't want to be married anymore. But I didn't right away. I didn't. It was scary to just change your whole life and blow everything up and, and completely like move into a new era and leave behind the stability that you had. And I was genuinely so like startled y'all when I stepped back and realized that I had been starting to do the same thing that she did. Like I, I didn't actually physically have contact with him, but nevertheless, I was still like staying in a situation and deceiving a person that I had the power to leave. It was just going to be difficult and it was going to be unpleasant. 
And I had to reevaluate myself and the fact that I like judged somebody so harshly and then went and did the same thing, really. Um, it's just life is like that. It really like you can think you have a really good handle on what somebody should have done. And I swear to God, it's like the powers that be know you're really judgmental about that. And they decide to literally put you in the same position and be like, really, bitch? Oh, you know what they should have done? Well, go ahead and do it then if you're so fucking smart. And it can be quite humbling. It really can. <laughs> so anyway, I just really liked that. And I liked the fact that like Hugh calls her out and she's a little startled because he's not the one that she thought would call her out. And he says that it's a lot more, it's a lot easier for him to stand up for a friend than for himself even if he's standing up to the person that he's also standing up for. And that is also a very real thing. I am the same way. Like when it comes to standing up for myself in any given situation, I have a much harder time. But when it's my friends, I will pull a knife on you. Like it is really foolish, foolish, foolish. Um, so we also have the conversation with a Lustin. And he tells them that he is going to be uh, going out on a mission and that he'll be making some arrangements and they should be fine. But when they ask when he'll be back, he's like, I really don't know. It could be a few weeks. It could be a lot longer or shit could go real, real wrong. And I don't come back at all. And Talia, to her credit, takes a moment to be like, I really want to believe he'll come back, but... I've seen people die, so I have to admit he may not. Um, so this is when we get the moment where Hugh hears roads behind him. All of them afterwards are sort of theorizing what could have been going on there. Of course, Talia just wants to fight this guy. Um, but we don't get any closure on that and what it means. And then chapter 10 is the hidden valley. I just want to say ranch after it. I'm sorry guys. Every time the hidden valley ranch, every time I just want to say it, the hidden valley, we are with a lesson. This is a pretty short chapter and he is, uh, trying to canvas different areas to find a place that I guess is going to be like, um, I don't know if it's a, what it is like a headquarters or something, but he's looking at different locations and this one, he is saying that there's too much wrong with it. Uh, there were few rivers or streams. It was barren. Um, and if the lack of water had been a recent development, it wouldn't have been an issue. But the valley curved to its flat bottom rather than descending at a sharper angle, indicating it had been formed by glaciers rather than rivers. Without water, it was clearly not a good candidate. Um and let's see. Oh, right. So he's ignoring this commotion behind him. And a little bit later, it turns out that there's these like wolf creatures that he's figuring out how to deal with. But for now, he's just trying to focus on his task. Uh, there was the ether situation. A viable candidate site needed to have historically low ether density, possibly even to the point of being a man of desert that had begun increasing recently. This site certainly met the last criteria, but uh, largely because of the labyrinth sitting smack dab in the center of the valley, he had known it wasn't a viable site just a few hours into his visit. While the candidate sites needed to have a mana well, it had to be a lateral well, not a junction well, and it certainly couldn't have a labyrinth in it. Sir, what? What, what do you mean? Um, and he, you know, just scrying it with his powers, he had known, but Candoran insists that he goes and like sees things in person. Um, and he had figured out the mystery of the valley's increasing ether density. Some idiot had decided to try and seal the labyrinth. Sealing a labyrinth, however, was almost never a good idea. Capping it in a way that allowed the ether density currents to still escape was a much better one. It's what they practiced at Skyhold, at the Gorgon capital, and at least a dozen other sites. 
The downside to that, of course, was that capping a labyrinth required constant maintenance and observation. They just wanted to shut down what they saw as a major threat. Um, it was probably a dragon that had sealed it. He was fairly sure Kandara knew what it was, but she wasn't talking. And then he talks about the dragons being really active lately. Um, with Andas Thun's territorial expansions. With Is that the one that like Indris mated with, I'm wondering? Um, the distressing number of major powers who either knew what was happening, suspected it, or were at least aware there was something going on. Of course, even if things weren't so tempestuous right now, he'd have no easy way to tell whose territory this valley had belonged to when the seal was built. And the, the, the seal is probably to keep things from escaping because stuff lives in labyrinths that you don't want to fucking deal with, which I do deeply understand um it would eventually rupture leaving the region flooded with highly dense ether it hadn't fully ruptured yet but alustin couldn't see the seal lasting more than a decade or so and as it began to leak ether it released inhabitants so he was dealing with a lot of monsters and this is when he sees these like weird chitinous wolf things dislike they sound fucking horrifying um and he has to like he's thinking about what to do with them and he, it's an interesting mention that he doesn't want to just use magic to destroy them because they can sense magic it seems and he figures they will that will just draw more of them to him um so he actually fights them physically fights them one of the creatures wasn't attacking him. It was just watching the whole ordeal from atop a nearby boulder. The leader, perhaps? No, more likely a lookout. Dismissing the matter, he ducked another lunge and considered his options. And he began funneling ma mana into his saber's activation spell forms. This has been a thorough waste of my time, he told the creatures as the spell forms of his saber began to glow. They didn't have any response beyond snarling, but then good conversation was always hard to find. And that is the end of chapter 10. So we are left with him out here trying to find places for what? I don't know. I'm kind of wondering if it's going to be like a headquarters for our folks, you know, the, the, the apprentice group. Um, I don't know what the rules are of leaving Skyhold. I don't know. Uh, <sighs> And why is it that you need to worry about shipping? And why is it that you need to worry about the mana being like low, but increasing over time? Like that don't know what those requirements are about. So who knows? Who knows? It's a mystery, but yeah, these are fun chapters and I'm really looking forward to, honestly, I'm still really weirdly obsessed with what's going on with Rhodes. But I also am really looking forward to seeing Godric get to use his weapon's power soon. Because that seems like it could have so many interesting uses. Also, what the fuck is the reaction of Talia's affinity on Dragonbone? Because she just drops this like tantalizing little bit and then she doesn't follow up. So I want to know about that too. Um, all right, guys. I'm going to wrap. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me. Thank you to Dan for commissioning this. Appreciate you a lot. And until next time. Toodaloo, motherfuckers.